Good morning, everyone, and welcoming to Worshipping in Styles within the Enticing Epiphany Expanse, as we are happy to be able to worship with you once again on this Sunday in the middle of January. And uh, some things have certainly been changed by COVID, but other things remain the same, like snow in January. So I hope wherever you are, you're warm and cozy and uh, in uh, having this opportunity for us to come together in community is a true blessing at this time and I hope that this will be a time of spiritual connection and strengthening for you as we continue to walk through these uncertain days. A few announcements for us. One is next week I'll be taking a week off. Actually I'm starting uh, tomorrow uh, and then I'm going until the 25th I guess. Is it the 24th is supposed to be the next Sunday? I'm, yeah. I'm bad at this kind of thing. Yeah. So we won't be on for the 24th, but I will be posting uh, through the course of this week some links to other places where you might find services online. I know there's, there are several who are still doing that. So I'll, I'll post links if you want to find a community to worship with next Sunday, and then we'll be back again uh, the following week on the 31st. After uh, the service on the 31st at 10, at, sorry, at 1230, so get yourself some lunch, and then we will be having a Zoom meeting for the board of uh, Seely's Bay Church, and we'll be sending out links closer to the time for the board members in Seely's Bay so that they can gather together. If you need help with that or if you need a phone number, just co please contact me uh, or Dave, you know, the email address for the church is there to let us know if you're needing a little help to get connected. The same will hold true the following uh, week on the 7th of February, where the Olivet and Lindhurst group will gather, and that will also be at 12.30, so grab yourself some lunch, and we will have the meeting then on the Sunday. Now, the 21st, will be the congregational meeting. So Jane, our secretary, will be sending out this week an email to our members uh, of the community, that's of, of all three of the congregations, uh, just to remind them about that. That will also be at 1230 on the 21st. And she will be asking you some questions about your connectivity. And again, whether you need a phone number or if you have unlimited minutes, you can use those, please, to call in and we can connect you up if Zoom is not something you're, you're comfortable with or have capacity for. And uh, she, so there will be some other questions there as well. But we're trying to get as much information so we can have a, a good connection and have as many people involved as we possibly can. So be aware of that. That's all upcoming. And, uh, and once again, Dave is just stellar at helping us with these things. And we're so happy to have him with us. Dave is working the controls and Gary is here with the music. So um, we thank them for being part of this as well. Okay, I know I'm forgetting something. I should have written this down. Oh, darn. What else am I forgetting? I don't know. This is stirring television, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know. If, I, if it comes to me... I, I will remember it, but I think the most pressing thing is just to let you know about the upcoming meetings and that I'm taking some holiday time. As far as what I've learned from COVID this week, it came to me as an epiphany, if you will. Remember, we're in the season of epiphany. Uh, earlier this week, I was looking out the window and thinking about these new restrictions that we're dealing with and, and the ongoing challenges of, of the pandemic. And I was reflecting on what's going on in the States and, and realizing that not only are they dealing with a pandemic at a, at a far more tragic level and at a widespread level than, than we are, but they're also dealing with huge political unrest. And the difference that that makes to know that as, as much as we are struggling and as much as we are also, you know, trying to work out the right and the best steps, we don't have governments openly warring with one another and we don't have uh, at least as far as I can tech, m massive ideological differences in our approaches to this thing. And I, I, I just, it's not something to be smug about. It's something to be mindful of. It's something to be aware of. It's something to remember in our prayer life that uh, our brothers and sisters in the South are, are dealing with just all of the horrendousness that we're dealing with on top of having so much uncertainty within their leadership roles. Hopefully, they'll get a little bit of stability following this week, but 
that's something that we can all pray for as well. And so do be mindful and aware in your prayer life of, of the U.S. Uh, in the next few weeks at least and carry on through. Our call to worship is written by David Sparks. It's from our Gathering magazine. <clears throat> he writes, Discipleship can be tiring, but God will give us the tenacity for the tough days. Discipleship can cause us to lose friends, but God will show us where our true loyalty lies. Discipleship can show us where we should place our trust and God will enable us to sort out our faithful priorities. Discipleship can be life-changing, and we will find authentic experience in the Christian life. We gather to find support and wisdom for our life as disciples. As a community committed to discipleship, let us worship God. And we light a candle. And take a minute to gather ourselves for worship. And we share our introit, which is born in human likeness. More voices, number 47. which is this. This is what I forgot. Jane would like your reports in for the annual report a little bit ahead of time uh, so that she can get that together. If you can uh, send her reports in Word or Excel, that would be favorite, but she also has capacity, I think, or we can work out how to convert documents. It's, but it's much easier for, for her if they're in Word or Excel. So Excel for spreadsheets for financials, and word for written reports would be great. That also reminds me, that leads me to remember that one of the questions that uh, Jane will be asking is if you would be, uh, if it would be enough for you to receive an electronic copy of the report or would you require a printed copy of the report. So again, given the different nature and how we'll be gathering together, it is possible for us to put an electronic report uh, on the website and online or as an email attachment. So you could either just have it as an electronic copy or you could print it off at home. So we'd, we'd like to know if we can reduce our numbers in printing a little bit. That would not be a bad thing either, just for the sake of the environment, among other things. So, so that'll be part of the email as well. So, aha! Occasionally, occasionally the old brain starts to work a little bit. Yes, so our opening prayer for this season, excuse me, is written by Gord Dunbar. Let us pray. Every time we answer your call, O God, we meet you again as if for the first time. Each moment is a revelation each meeting leads to our hearts opening wider to you and to others. Each encounter shines light onto the strength of relationships fostered while following Jesus the Christ. 
the one who invites and equips, the one who is companion and guide, the one who is giver and gift. In his name we gather this day. Amen. Our opening hymn is a, is a is a nice bouncy kind of was it is, is bouncy an insult to, to, to call a, to call a hymn bouncy? I sometimes wonder if if that's the uh, the right word. It helps if I look it up in the right hymn book too. I'm looking at 87 in more voices and going, hey, that's not it, but it is in fact 87 in Voices United. And it is a wonderful hymn for Epiphany. James, Jim Strath D uh, really uh, hits a home run with this one, I think. I am the light of the world. You people come and follow me. have a coffee in your hand you were bouncing around so much that it actually sloshed the coffee a little bit not enough to spill it on your dressing gown you know but I'd, I'd like to think that you were you were you were bopping around a little bit to that one now we are in John's gospel and after Epiphany there, there tend to be stories of the early church uh, and how the church comes into being, stories of gathering of the disciples, uh, stories of, of early confrontations that Jesus has with, with leaders and authorities. 
the temptations are often at the beginning of the story. So this is, this is an early story of Jesus calling disciples. So in John's Gospel, he has already uh, called um, Simon and, uh, and, um, and so and Andrew. But then the story continues with Philip and Nathaniel, and that's where we pick up the story in John chapter 1, verses 43 to 51. The next day, and again after that first calling story, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him, he said of him, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. May God bless this reading from God's holy word. Amen. The question that I asked you in preparation for this was around your enthusiasms, the things that incite you and inspire you, engage you, the things that, uh, that are really uh, restorative for you, the things that bring you joy or even hope or healing. And, and there are some activities that, that can certainly do these things for us. And, and COVID time has been such a strange time because uh, as far as enthusiasms go, for some people, their enthusiasms have been uh, able to be amplified because of the time that they've had to themselves. I mean, for the readers in the world who love books and long for the opportunity to have time to sit with them, it, it could be an opportunity for that. I think my father has gone through more puzzles than usual, and uh, my mother has just knit up a storm. You, you wouldn't believe it. I don't know when I call how she has the time to put down the needles enough to, to answer the phone. I think she needs a cordless so that she can keep going while she's uh, talking to me on the phone. She can still be knitting. So for some of us, oh, and I've also seen, you know, posted some, some fantastic artwork uh, some from within our community as well that, that people have had the opportunity I guess to to go back to or things that uh, people have left aside for a while and in this time we've been able to go back to those things and hopefully that uh, opportunity to express that artistic flair is, is strengthening for people in this time. But of course there's, there's also been real challenges to some of the enthusiasms that people have Certainly, I know um, for myself, being there's a few uh, organizations that I belong to um, that when we're not able to meet in community and share fellowship, that's, that's been a real loss. And certainly for church and, and uh, uh, just that, that simple act of being able to come together and worship has been a real challenge and a struggle. So we attempt to do that, but it's it's probably not the, the full richness that, that we would like of, of having that experience of community, particularly sharing food together. And I know singing is something that a lot of people are passionate about. We, we met a friend of ours at one point earlier um, in this month who was talking about singing in, I think, the Oriana Singers. So, I mean, it's a pretty serious group. And uh, they gather together each section and they try to do things online as you know, they so they'll have a zoom meeting, for example, and the section master. So for the altos, for example, will be there on the zoom with everybody and uh, they'll be singing the part. But of course, with zoom, when they're singing the part and the other people are singing back, they're all muted. 
So all the singing master can do is kind of look to see, okay, how's the mouth doing? Because they can't actually hear uh, how the singers are going in their practice. So again, there are things that we have, have really uh, lost, which is, which is a, great, a great pity. So for your own self, think about those enthusiasms. I hope that maybe you can find some new enthusiasms. I know my, my crossword guru, Brendan Emmett Quigley, who has uh, two, he posts two puzzles a week. And uh, he, so he's got a lot of interior and solitary things, but also goes to a lot of crossword conventions and all of that. But he was posting the other day that uh, he's taken up hiking with the family. And I think he's in Massachusetts, but uh, he mentions that they've been able to explore corners of his state that, that he'd never been able to see before as a result of, of being able to get out and walk around a little bit. And uh, so there can sometimes be some real hidden blessings when we, when we adapt and, and when we find new things to empower us and to excite us. That word enthusiasm is actually a really interesting word. I, I did not know that uh, the roots of enthusiasm, it's a Greek word coming from enthusiasmos. And if you can sort of tease out a little bit of Greek, entheos, entheosiasmos, it initially referred to a very specific form of, of inspiration and, and joy, which was being inspired by the presence of God in God. And Theos, you would find this, this spiritual uplifting and this spiritual uh, encouragement and healing. And it's only been in the English language for, I don't know, maybe three or four hundred years now, but for the first half of that time at least, it was exclusively used in reference to, to religious experiences. So if someone was an enthusiast, you knew exactly what they were talking about. That was a religious term. So an enthusiast was someone who was inspired by the will and the presence and the power of God. And it's only later on, after maybe the 18th century, early 17th, I don't know, that it, it became more of a general term to describe within the secular world, whatever it was that, that um, floated your boat turned your crank, whatever it is, the phrases that we use to describe our enthusiasms now. So when we encounter Philip in today's reading, here is an enthusiast in the classic sense of the term. He has encountered Jesus and Jesus has really just given him a, a simple call and encouragement to follow me. He may have heard a little bit from, from Simon and Andrew about who this might be, but it clicks for him. It becomes something that, that inspires him. And he's enthusiastic about taking what he has discovered about this, this man, this Jesus of Nazareth, who is the son of God in his reckoning, in his understanding. And he wants to share that with the world. And of course, first person, I don't know, maybe it's the first person he, he tells is Nathaniel. And Nathaniel responds with, what is surely one of the most classic kind of slams or snubs within scripture. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Now, when I was thinking about this, this uh, talk, this sermon this morning, when I thought about the word enthusiasm, inevitably I, I went to a series called Curb Your Enthusiasm. And I don't know if you've heard of that show, but it's, it's, it was running for about 10 years went on a hiatus. It's now back again, I think, with some new episodes, but it, it follows Larry David, who is an actual person, but it's sort of a fictionalized account of his life as a writer and producer in Hollywood. And, and Larry David is sort of a chainsaw to social norms, you know, so that where people, when they say things or, or when they share their enthusiasms, I mean, people tend to respond oh, that's nice, or, or whatever, or, or tell me more. But, but Larry would be the kind of guy who would roll up the window while you are midway talking about the great golf game that you just shot. Or um, there's another classic bit where uh, a, a very white couple comes and shares their baby pictures with him and his friends around the table. And, you know, the, the other two make the classic kind of, oh, it's a beautiful baby, you, you must be so you know, blessed to have this child. And, and Larry looks at the picture and he goes, well, she looks a little, she looks a little Asian. <laughs> Which has the father doing a serious double take. Like, why would you say that? What are you trying to get at? You know, like, 
But that's just Larry. Larry would, would be um, a tremendous source of discomfort. You really wouldn't want to see him, I think, in your own social gathering. He famously goes to a, a conservative Jewish dinner and they're blessing the food and all of this and, and they're decrying that the, there's a Palestinian chicken place that's going to be opening right next to a Jewish delicatessen. And, and Larry just says, well, I've heard the chicken's really good. And he goes on and on about all of this, much of the discomfort of the guests. So, but, but Larry serves an interesting purpose, which is to, to, to further perhaps uh, uh, deepen what can often be a, a very surface level kind of interaction and as uncomfortable as it is. And again, you wouldn't want to do this full time. And I don't know if you'd really want to be in the man's presence for very long. There are moments when, when you, you learn a little bit more about people uh, because he, he refuses to be conventional. And I think in the same way, Nathaniel, this is a classic Larry Davidism, really. He, he takes somebody's enthusiasm and he just goes, boom. And it's reflected in the stories about how the Messiah uh, will come into the world. Later on in John's Gospels, particularly in the seventh chapter, over and over again, you hear conflicts from the religious leaders who are coming to some of Jesus's new followers and, and the people who have, who have taken Jesus to be uh, the son of God and the son of man. And over again, the, the religious leaders say, look, don't you know prophecy? Like nothing comes from Galilee. No prophet could come from there. Like you, you, you can't have somebody come from Nazareth. It's just not, it's, it's not possible that, that something good could come from Nazareth. So how do you respond to that? Like, if you've got something that's a real passion of yours and you want to share that with somebody and they look at you and they go, well, that's dumb. Or like, you you really, you waste your time with that? You know, like there's a number of ways you could respond to that, right? I mean, you could certainly respond with anger, flare right back at the person and say, well, what do you mean by that? You know, or, or you could try to convince them with words to say, no, 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 it's great. I think I've told this story before, but one of my favorite uh, stories along this line was going to see the, uh, the rock collection. There's a museum of all things in, in St. John's up on Signal Hill, which is a geological museum, you know, and, and there's, it's just rocks. Like you, you go into the museum and it's all about rocks. And I'm sitting there looking at all of this stuff and, you know, talking about timelines, geological eras and what different rocks look like. And against my, uh, to my utter amazement, you know, I'm, I'm actually sort of finding this a bit interesting. But, but there's a guide, a very enthusiastic young lady who, who um, I'm, I'm looking at all this stuff and she comes over and says, do you have any questions? And, uh, you know, I say, well, I, I never thought that, that rocks could be, could be interesting. Oh, no, 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 rocks are tremendously interesting. And I think she would have gone on probably for about 20 minutes if I'd <laughs> really said, no, I'm sorry, boy, gee, the time is just going. But, but that kind of passion, when you put yourself out there, can, can be hard to, it can be hard to be uh, slammed. It can be hard to, to, to receive criticism when you're, you're really trying to express something that, that is deep within your own soul and that has great meaning for you. And I think as, as Christians, and when we talk about discipleship, and we, when we talk about getting the message of, of who Christ is out into the world, that can present a real challenge for us because now I think more than ever, um, well, I shouldn't say that because in the early days of, of the Christian church, certainly uh, Christians were, were persecuted violently and put to death sometimes. and and uh, were thought of as, as cannibals because of misunderstandings around what communion was. So there may have been times actually where it was worse. But, but right now, if you put yourself out there and say, well, th th this faith means something to me, you know, like having Jesus in my heart and in my life has, has transformed me. I, I see the world differently. I, I see people as, as brothers and sisters rather than as competitors or, or enemies or, or, or not even thinking about them at all, which is often the case for many of us. We just don't think about our neighbors. But Jesus calls us to, to think about our neighbors and, and to love our neighbors and to try to understand how we do that. So, to, to try to say that to somebody that we don't know or to, to want to share that word and risk, well, that's dumb or that's not scientific or it's not factual. You have no proof of that. 
um, you're, you're, it's magical thinking, it's wrong thinking, it's delusional, you know, all of those things that are, that are slams, classic Larry Davidisms, really, we, we, we struggle to know how to respond to that. But I think Philip has, has a really interesting response. You know, he doesn't respond with anger. He doesn't respond with a whole long discussion right off the top to try to convince Nathaniel that, well, you know, I, I understand what scriptures might say, but listen, you know, this, these are some of the possibilities that might have to do with the interpretation of scripture, and maybe it's not that, you know, he doesn't get into that technical stuff. What does he do? He repeats, really, what Jesus says himself earlier in John's Gospel. Come and see. Have a look. Just, just take some time. And I think that's a really nice response. Just come and see. Not pressuring. It's an invitation. It's an, it's an openness. Just, just to come and spend some time with me. And, and see for yourself what this means. And certainly, Nathaniel, much to his credit, and probably much unlike someone like Larry David, accepts the invitation and goes with him. Probably maybe somewhat grudgingly, but, but does say, okay, I'll come with you. And what follows is a fascinating exchange between Jesus and Nathanael, which is about knowledge, it's about insight, it's about Jesus having seen Nathanael in a way that is, is stronger than just vision, but, but has, has looked into who he is as a person, interestingly praises him as an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. So there's an authenticity in, in Nathanael uh, bringing a criticism to Philip, which, which also shouldn't be overlooked. I mean, there is something good in what Nathaniel has said, in, in that he is being true to his roots and to his heritage. And, and so Jesus welcomes that, and, and he, he, he cites it as, as something good within Nathaniel. And yet Nathaniel is also open to, to receiving who Jesus is, and what Jesus' roots are, and how Jesus is rooted in the divine, in holiness, and in the power of God. And Nathaniel becomes one who recognizes that this truly is the Son of Man and the Son of God, and so is empowered, and so is strengthened. So there's a lot happening in this story, and it's a story about enthusiasms, and it's a story about openness, and it's a story about truth. And I hope that for you and I in this time, which is admittedly a challenging one, where some of the traditional ways in which we express our enthusiasm about God in, in worship and in singing and in sharing food together, like a lot of people slam like coffee hour as being, well, you know, it's, it's extraneous to church. No, it isn't. You know, like that's an opportunity for us to deepen our connections, deepen our relationships. It's always good to remember that in coffee hour, one opportunity that prevents, presents itself is that we can actually go and speak to someone we wouldn't usually speak to, right? And that's one of the things about coffee hours that, and this is like any coffee hour I've ever been a part of, we like to talk to the people that we, we, we know best. But, but perhaps the invitation of Philip can be in our heads to say, come and see, you know, come and see what somebody else is doing and come and see... What, what somebody else's enthusiasms or passions or understandings are rather than just sharing within ourselves. So that's for further down the road when once again we can, we can come together. But for the meantime, I hope that you are able to find enthusiasms which speak to your faith. In a time of isolation, it is an opportunity for, for prayer. And, and prayer is, is a powerful way for us when we have time to sit and to organize our thoughts, to, to, to understand our priorities as, as, our, as our call to worship uh, reminded us that the Christian faith is one way to help us prioritize how we are to live, and we can sometimes do that in prayer. If we are to snap prayer, if we are to say, okay, pray, what's the first thing that comes into your mind? And reflect on that. Why is that there? Why is that the first thing? And maybe are there other elements that, that you would not think ordinarily about including within your prayers? And, and, and why is that? And, and maybe this is an opportunity to, to bring uh, other aspects of this experience of life 
into our prayers or to reach out and, and call one another. Or, or there are many different ways where we can stay connected to read scripture. Uh, go to a book that's been difficult for you and, and try to read it again and, and look for new insights. Uh, go beyond the familiar within scripture within that book. Or perhaps maybe you'll have to blow the dust off it or look for it. That's fine. You know, no judgment. But if you've got a Bible, have a look. And you know what? It's online, believe it or not, in a lot of different translations. So if you're online, you can find one too. But find a way. This is an opportunity for us to strengthen our faith, to, to find new ways to express. Painting is another great thing. Turn your, turn your theological mind to your painting. How would you express God or the Holy Spirit or Christian community in art or in music, in song? Create. There is always opportunity for us to grow and to share our enthusiasms. May it be so. Amen. What is it? One forty? No, no, I've got it here. Sorry, <laughs> I'll be okay. We're going to sing. We cannot own the sunlit sky. Its uh, words are by Ruth Duck, who's written some really fantastic hymns, including um, "Will You Come?" No, um, the one we sang. <sighs> I shouldn't do this. Arise, your light has come. Yes, the one we sang last week. I think is one that was written by her. But the music is very traditional, and see if you can catch what tune this is as we sing We Cannot Own the Sunlit Sky.
And if you said, what is, how can I keep from seeing, singing? <laughs> that is correct. And you win, well, our admiration. There you go. Incidentally, you know, tune into Jeopardy for the next little while. There's some fascinating guest hosts coming up, including Aaron Rodgers, the quarterback of the Green Bay Packers, and uh, Mayim Bialik from uh, the Big Bang Theory, and Blossom will be hosting. Hmm. Not too many uh, actors slash neurophysicists out there in the world, but she's one of them. So that's a pretty fascinating combination. <laughs> now, listen, Minute for Missions. I have a story to tell you about that. I didn't lose my mind. They didn't come in yet. So it wasn't that I wasn't able to find them. I literally did not have them. So they came in this week. And the surprise is that they've changed up the format. So it's no longer a reading per, per Sunday. There are eight or nine, I think, stories. They're, they're more in-depth stories. And they have pictures. And they have um, um, uh, different things, prayers. They're basically like almost little studies. So that's all well and good, but it doesn't really work well with this format. Curiously enough, the reason why they changed, at least in part, was they felt that these stories about community uh, weren't really jibing with the experience that people were having with, with lockdowns. But my own humble opinion is uh, I'm, I'm not sure that that was the right thing to do because I think people are inspired by stories of community even if they can't... Uh, experience at the moment it is it is good to think about those times and to long for the times when we can do things again but so all i can say is i'm not happy but uh so um we may have to look at doing things a little bit differently but nevertheless no matter whether we have stories or not uh, we know the importance of, of mission and service we know the importance of including not just our, our financial giving for our own community but a reminder that, that our community is beyond the walls of a church. It's beyond the walls of our homes. Uh, if anything, this COVID has demonstrated to us that we can still be community, even if we're not gathered in a building. Again, it's not quite the same. It's not ideal, but we can do it. And so Mission Service reminds us that we have a worldwide community of faith and we have a worldwide obligation and responsibility as people of faith, as disciples of Jesus Christ, to, to consider how we can help in the world and how we can make a difference. So, all of that in mind as we gather in prayer today. So let us pray. Gracious God, we are always so grateful for, for the early church, for the ways in which the first followers of this man, Jesus, responded so openly and so willingly at times when it was a real risk to run against the cultural and societal and theological norms of that day. But they were able to engage that risk and, and still be able to express their truth in what they had seen and what they had come to know in how they had heard the story of God being expressed in human form. We give thanks that we have the opportunity to continue that story in who we are as disciples of Jesus Christ. We give thanks for all of the ways in which we feel inspired, excited, made whole, made strong in our own enthusiasms, our, our talents and our gifts, the ways in which we spend time that, that bring us good feelings that help to renew us. And we ask that the spiritual renewal, which is in hearing your word, in reflecting on your call, and in responding to our claim to be disciples, can help strengthen us and help strengthen this world, even in these most trying of times. We continue to hold in prayer those who are making decisions the tough choices that need to be made. We reflect on those who are suffering economically because of this lockdown. Be with them, help them and hold them. Let them know that they are not alone in their struggle and in their, in their journeying through this. Be with the churches that are finding ways to gather, that they may continue on doing ministry locally being a presence in the place, 
to help show your love at this time and in this place. We certainly hold our American friends in our prayers as they are about to inaugurate a new president, that there may be a sea change in how they are with one another and with the world. To be responsible, but to also work towards healing. And we hope and we pray that in our own communities, things may not become more fractured and more violent, but we cannot see our future. But you do call us to, to play a small part in bringing the kingdom. So let us work for peace. Let us work for patience, for prudence. We hold those who are in hospital, those who are facing physical and also mental sickness. We know that these times take their tolls in many ways, not just on the body, but also on the mind and on the soul. Bring healing, we pray, to those who need it. And for those who are gathered in this community at this time, we make space, we make room for all prayers. Prayers of joy, prayers of sadness, prayers of thanksgiving, prayers of regret. God, hear our community at prayer. God, hear us as we pray. We pray in Jesus' name who taught these words to us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. This is a hymn in More Voices 161. Um, I have called you by your name. It, it tends to be, while looking at the words, it, it's, it's, it's closely tied to the idea of ordination and call in a particular way. It's often sung uh, for newly ordained ministers, but there is a wider sense to it as well and that each one of us is called by name to find our own ways to be disciples and to engage the things which which inspire us about the faith and to go into the world. So this is, I have called you by your name, you are mine, You are. I have gifted you and ask you now to shine. Let us sing it. Oh. 
ask you now to shine. I will not abandon you. All my promises are true. You are gifted, called, and chosen. You are mine. I will help you learn my name as you go. Read it written in my people. Help them soul can claim, offer Jesus' body given long ago. I know you will need my touch as you go. Feel it pulsing in creation's ebb and flow. Like the woman reaching out, choosing faith in spite of doubt, Hold the hem of Jesus' robe and let it go. I have given you a name, it is mine. I have given you my spirit as a sign. With my wonder in your soul, make my wounded children whole. Go and tell my precious people they are mine. It's the Johnson Geo Center. I couldn't remember the name of the Rock Museum. It's the Johnson Geo Center. So if you ever have a chance to travel to the Atlantic ever again, uh, you might want to go and check it out, and you may or may not become enthused about rocks. I make no promises, but there's the potential. There's the potential. If you come and see, you'll never know. All right. So, again, I'll be off next week, but I'll, I'll be posting uh, probably around midweek uh, some options for you to find a community or you can find one on yourself. You're certainly able to do that. And then we'll be back again on the 31st. And after that service, remember that we'll have the uh, Sealy's Bay crowd together after supper. So, until that time, may the love of God and the peace of Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always.
Thank you.